grace and peace be with you. Come and worship, all you who love and serve the Lord. Outsiders, insiders, old-timers and newcomers, young, old, and in-between, on behalf of First Mennonite Church, I welcome you. For this morning's call to worship, I'll be reading from Psalm 19, verses 7 to 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us pray. Liberating God, in love you have set us free. Free from slavery to sin and self. Free to know and love you free to follow and serve you. We praise you for your faithful love toward us and for the many ways you've demonstrated that love to us. We see your love in the natural world around us, in the sky and trees and rivers. We see your love in the gift of your commandments, the rules for living that guide us into right relationship with you and with the people around us. And we see your love in Jesus Christ, who lived and died to bring new life. Because of your great love, we bring before you the needs of ourselves and our world. In your unfailing love, O God, hear our prayers. We pray for those who live surrounded by violence and conflict, whether from war or political unrest, crime, or all forms of abuse. We pray for the people of Afghanistan today, for families and individuals living in fear, insecurity, and unsafe conditions. May your presence of peace find a way in that situation. We pray for those who live surrounded by disaster and destruction, for our neighbors in the U.S. who have experienced firsthand the ravages of Hurricane Ida over this past week. We pray for safety and relief. We pray also for the ongoing recovery efforts in Haiti, and the wildfires still destroying large swaths at home here in Canada. Lead us as individuals, as well as corporate and governmental leaders, to work at instilling practices and creating policies that sustain and rehabilitate the gift of this earth, rather than exploiting and destroying it in the name of greed. We pray for our homes and families, for parents juggling the responsibilities of work, family, and all that mid-pandemic back-to-school entails. We ask, especially this week, that students and teachers, parents, support staff, and administration would be reassured in the days ahead, working together to keep our communities safe so that learning, playing, developing, and imagining can continue safely throughout this school year. We pray for the vulnerable and languishing members in our community and circles of family and friends. Give them the courage to seek help or support if they need it, and give us the energy to do what we can to help those who need assistance or companionship. For those who are feeling lost or isolated, those who are nearing the end of their life on this earth, and those who are experiencing pain of any kind, we pray that they would feel your comforting presence in these days, O oh God. Hold them and their loved ones in the palm of your hand so that whatever is troubling them, they do not feel alone, because you are with us always, and because in Jesus, you have suffered through the worst of what the human experience holds, and even all the pain of this world couldn't swallow up your great love. 
For this and all the other gifts we receive in life, we give thanks. We ask that you would make us bold in living faithfully according to your vision of shalom. Guard our hearts and minds from all that might distract us from your good ways, and guide us to find purpose and meaning in serving you. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and of the Spirit, and the Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Be my guide, God of Abraham, lead me by your hand, you are strong and wise. I want to trust in you, and in all I do, bring you honor and praise. How I love you, great and mighty King. You are faithful through the ages. You never change. Be my God. Dark of night, set all fear to fly to our hope and truth. I want to trust in you and in all I do. Hi everyone. For today's children's story, we're going to be reading from the Shine Bible. And our story today is called New Heaven and New Earth. A man named John was sent to the island of Patmos, away from all his family and friends, as punishment for following Jesus. While he was there, all alone, he had a vision. This is what he saw and heard. There was a new heaven and a new earth. I saw God's holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It looked as festive as a bride at her wedding. I heard a loud voice saying, this is God's home. 
God will live here with the people and wipe everyone's tears away. There will be no more dying. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. All those things will be gone. See, I am making all things new. I am the beginning and the end. I will give the water of life to those who are thirsty. I will be their God and they will be my children. John heard and saw these things and many other things in his vision. He fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to him. But the angel told him, don't worship me, worship God. Let's think back to the beginning of our story today. John was sent to an island all alone with no family or friends. He must have felt pretty lonely. And I think probably all of us feel lonely sometimes. What made John feel better was hearing God's words and knowing that God is always with him and is always gonna take care of him. The next time you feel lonely, think back to this story and remind yourself that God is always with you and God is going to take care of you. Have a lovely week. As we give thanks for the gifts given this week, I want to read the words of a familiar hymn that we haven't sung together in quite some time. God, whose giving knows no ending, from your rich and endless store, nature's wonder, Jesus' wisdom, costly cross, grave's shattered door. Gifted by you, we turn to you, offering up ourselves in praise. Thankful song shall rise forever, gracious donor of our days. Skills and time are ours for pressing toward the goals of Christ your Son. All at peace and health and freedom, races joined, the church made one. Now direct our daily labor, lest we strive for self alone. Born with talents, make us servants fit to answer at your throne. Treasure, too, you have entrusted. Gain through powers your grace conferred. Ours to use for home and kindred and to spread the gospel word. Open wide our hands in sharing as we heed Christ's ageless call. Healing, teaching, and reclaiming, serving you by serving all. Amen. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia, Thou burning sun with golden beam, Thou silver moon with softer Best 
exalt both form and light. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 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 Dear Mother Earth, who day by day Blessings on our way. Alleluia, alleluia. The flowers and fruits that in me grow, let them God's glory also show. Creator bless and worship God in humbleness. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit three in one. Oh, praise Him. Revelations three, eighteen to 22 Therefore I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white robes to clothe you, and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So we've come to the end of our summer series. 
I hope that the services, songs, and images have helped give some shape to the movements that we find in the Bible. The Bible is an archive of witnesses who have struggled with and celebrated the life of faith. Faith in a God who creates, unmakes, and creates again. A God of love who holds both grace and justice. We conclude this series at the end with the witness of Revelation. Now, of course, the book of Revelation is often viewed as sort of the final statement about the end. But I want you to remember, if you can, the first sermon in our series on Genesis 1, where we saw that God creating the world was not a one-time event, but represented God's ongoing creative work in which God continued to make and unmake and make again. And so in this way, we can see that Revelation also stands in a long history of prophecy, and it is not the only vision of the future that has been offered, and it is not the final vision that we have. For instance, much of the language and imagery of Revelation is taken directly from the visions in the final chapters of the book of Isaiah. And so, prophecy offers us revelation. Revelation not in the sense of predicting the future, but rather in seeing the present clearly so that we can better understand future implications of the present moment. Prophets offer a vision for our lives. And so it is fitting to conclude our series with Revelation, not simply because it speaks about the future, but because it offers a vision reminding us that we are still a part of these witnesses. Visions and the witnesses of faith do not end with the Bible. For myself, growing up in an environment that tended to view the Bible as a sort of closed code for determining truth or authority, it took me some time to even recognize passages like in John's Gospel where Jesus said, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that testify on my behalf, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. We are called to scripture, but scripture calls us to look up and to look out for visions today. And so thinking about this series as a whole, I hope it has encouraged you to see the value in the Bible not as a final, finished statement, but as a kaleidoscopic witness to living God, to a living God, and to human faith. So the question we want to arrive at, both as we look at Revelation and as we conclude this series, is whether we have received a vision of faith for this time and place. I like how the King James Bible renders Proverbs 29, verse 18, saying, Where there is no vision, the people perish. We cannot simply claim the Bible as our vision, but through it we learn to seek the living God who have, we have been following this summer. Now, what is interesting about the book of Revelation is that before all the dramatic imagery of heaven and hell, of angels and elders, beasts and dragons, we are given an image of the church. Seven lampstands represent the churches, with the Son of Man walking among them, holding seven stars, which are the angels of the churches. And then what follows are seven messages. Messages not mysterious or symbolic, but practical, encouraging and critical. Some churches are praised for their patient endurance. Others are comforted in their persecutions. Most have need for repentance in some area. These churches are offered a vision 
not to confound or confuse, but to clarify, to help them see things rightly that they may be able to live accordingly. The reading for today came from a message to the last of the seven churches. Now, seemingly, there is little good that can be said about this church. God says that their works are neither hot nor cold. I used to think that this meant God wanted the people to at least be passionate, whether good or bad. But the reference appears to be about water sources. There are hot water sources that are said to have healing properties, and there are cold water sources that are good and refreshing for drinking. But the water of this church is lukewarm, sort of gross, tepid, murky, maybe contaminated, only good to be spit out. The message goes on to say that the church thinks it is wealthy and healthy, when in fact it is poor and sick. Now this is often what a vision offers. You see things this way, when in fact it is another way. You seem to have all you need in water and wealth, but the water is making you sick, and the wealth has no real value. So when a vision comes to us, we are faced with another way to see and understand ourselves and the world, and then it is up to us to honestly and courageously discern the implications for change. This is not an easy process, and it is never something we fully or finally complete. But the question, I think, remains, do we have a vision for our life or for the church today? And how would we know when we encountered it? A few things came to my mind as I reflected on what visions for today could mean. I recently listened to a young woman speak on addictions. She was in her late 20s and reflected how on everyone seemed to be a similar place at the start of their 20s, working or going to school, partying a little on the weekends. But as the 20s progressed, she noticed a divide between those who began to succeed in their career or relationships and those who struggled for whatever reason and found themselves turning more often to substance use. Now, on one level, you could listen to this woman and, and think of it as a cautionary tale, warning kids to work hard and stay at school to avoid the perils of drug use. But I wondered about a vision that might see this differently. I wondered if the differences described by this woman were really two sides of the same coin. Can we see in our society that success often has little grace to it, and that failure always looms as a threat for those dealing with mental illness, difficult relationships, bad mistakes, or simple dumb luck? Can we see that perhaps what we call success inevitably requires not only our allegiance and often exhaustion, but also the failure of others? How else do we know if we have succeeded if not for the losers? How else will we stay successful unless we give everything to it? Listen again to the vision for the last church in Revelation. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Yet you do not realize that you are wretched, poor, and blind. What is this vision here? Can we see when our value and success ends up producing unnecessary failures in others and exhaustion in ourselves? Do we have another vision of value and success and well-being that we can offer in its place? Revelation continues with the Son of Man saying, Buy Buy from me my gold 
refined by fire so that you may be rich, robes to cover your shame, and finally salve to anoint your eyes so that you can see. Where are such things offered in our world? And are we willing to trade what we have to acquire them? I think most of us have experienced for ourself or for a loved one the need for another vision of well-being. As I thought about visions today, I also thought about the competing visions we encounter as we continue to wrestle with responses to COVID. On one hand, there is a vision of freedom, and on the other, a vision of care. Now, I suspect in most situations, we would say we value both, but I also imagine you know the difference I'm referring to. There is a vision for life in which each individual should receive the highest level of freedom in the choices they can make. Again, I think most of us value the level of freedom we have, and this sort of freedom makes a lot of sense if most things in life are equal. But many things in life are not equal, and so the vision of this sort of freedom tends to attract those who have been used to already having the benefits of society as it's structured. And so in response to COVID, I can't think of any disability or anti-poverty groups that have been supporting this vision of freedom, I suspect because they have already been hard at work trying to overcome the restrictions placed on their freedoms in what we would otherwise call normal times. The other vision is one of care, care at all costs. I would say that the majority of our decisions as a church during COVID have leaned toward this vision. And again, this makes sense. Why wouldn't we want to take action that can prevent the risk of spreading a disease that particularly targets the elderly and vulnerable? But as this situation has dragged on, we've seen the impacts of isolation as a form of care. We couldn't simply care through isolation without paying the added costs of mental illness, addictions, unequal economic hardship, and struggling relationships. And of course, we've seen again how the wealthy are able not only to weather this reality better, but at times even profit from it. And as I thought of this vision of care, I think if we push it far enough, Focusing solely on care in this way, it forces us to face the question of what we are actually preserving life for. Is the extension of biological life always the highest principle? Or must we also come to realize that in the end, our lives must be given or offered to use our religious language? Italian philosopher Giorgio Gombin has recently written on this theme. It doesn't hurt to remember uh, how deep the history of this short pandemic is for the people of Italy as he reflects on this. In wrestling between the themes of care and freedom, Agamben acknowledges that humans must be able to give themselves reasons and justification for their lives and then he wonders how in much of the developed Western world, many of those traditional reasons have disappeared. And so he says, with the pandemic, we are faced with, in perhaps unprecedented clarity, the question of biological existence. Is this all there is, just to live as long as possible? Without any other reason, Agamben feels we can end up being subjected to what he calls a sanitary terror in the name of care, rather than being willing to explore new ways of living appropriately alongside one another. 
he concludes by saying, just as it makes no sense to sacrifice freedom in the name of freedom, so it is not possible to renounce in the name of life what makes life worth living. We cannot champion a freedom that does not seek the freedom of all. But we also cannot care for life in ways that will slowly drain what makes life worth living. As with the young woman who spoke of 20-year-olds emerging into adulthood, so too we, at hopefully this late stage of the pandemic, will once again need a vision of life if we hope to flourish. The vision of Revelation still offers us some guidance. The Son of Man says to the churches, Listen, I am standing at the door, knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. So what is our vision for renewed connection and restored relationships in this time? To be sure, it will remain a matter of navigating freedom and care, boundaries and grace. But do we see something to offer our life to, to offer our church in the service of? We responded to small knocks this past year on the door of our church, welcoming a group from Shoal Lake 40 to make Christmas hampers, later giving rest to a group traveling on their way to to support Indigenous land defenders. We need to learn how to open the door even in this time. It is my hope and prayer that you as individuals and we as a church encounter a vision of well-being beyond exhausting success and relentless failure, a vision of healing and communion where we discard isolating freedom but then can rest in collective care, where we are not afraid to open the door to the one who is still calling the one who asks we share what we have and receive what we need. May we have eyes to see this vision and the faith to follow. Amen. May God's vision be your vision. Let it hold you and let it send you so that you would become restless and never be at peace until all are fed until all know what home is, until all are free, until justice is done, until peace is the way, until grace is the law, until love is the rule, until God's realm comes. Amen.